The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Access Television, the City of Oshkosh, the Oshkosh Cable Television Advisory Commission, or Time Warner Cable. Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Ion Oshkosh. I'm Cheryl Hentz. Uh, Dan Rylance, my uh, usual co-host, is not here this evening. He's out of town, I believe is what he told me. So anyway, um, I'm winging it tonight with our two guests, whom I'm sure uh, most of you, if not all of you, are probably familiar with. Um, to my right is attorney Chuck Williams. Uh, he is here along with a gentleman to my left, Dr. Michael Biridi from the uh, University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh. Now, uh, Dr. Biridi is uh, the professor and coordinator of the Urban and Regional Studies Program at UW Oshkosh, correct? Yes, correct. All right. Well, thank you both very much um, for being here, especially in light of what I think is probably going to be some pretty wild weather tonight. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully we well. can make it through the next hour without uh, a tornado warning going off or anything. A couple of things that we're going to be discussing this evening. Uh, number one, we want to give you folks an update on the uh, proposed fishing pier for Miller's Bay in Menominee Park. Um, that has been going on for about two years now. Uh, the most recent activity was held a month ago, uh, and that involved um, a two-day hearing in front of an administrative law judge. And we're going to talk about uh, uh, you know, what happened at that hearing and what has happened since, and we're awaiting a judge's ruling on that um, whole situation with the pier sometime around the 1st of July. So we're going to recap what happened in the beginning with the pier, then move up to what's gone on with the hearing, and what has happened since then. And then uh, later on in the program, in, in the time that we have left over, we want to talk about um, what's happening with the Riverfront Development and the Access Acquisition Group. And uh, along with that, a proposed idea for along Oshkosh Avenue, um, a $20 million project that has kind of been floated uh, in the area. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But for right now, let's, um, let's jump into this peer issue. Um, the pier's been slated to go into Miller's Bay, uh, as we said, at the end of New York Avenue. Uh, now, the pier was donated to the city by the Otter Street Fishing Club, and um, it was approved at a Parks Board meeting, and that was, uh, Chuck, was that two years ago this month? It was June 13th, 2005. Okay, so and we're taping this ago. on June 7th, so yeah, just about two years ago. Right. And then the very following night, it was approved at the city council meeting. And it was uh, one of the arguments, of course, has been all along that it was fast-tracked. And, and I use that word very deliberately because that is the phrase that uh, our parks director, Tom Stefani, had used. Um, so I, I think that's fair. So, uh, of course, there were other concerns. Uh, one of them that if installed, the neighbors and residents would lose the last natural vista to Lake Winnebago from Oshkosh. And we've got a photo here that, um, that you brought. And uh, I think it's important for <coughs> viewers to see this. Um, this is the vista uh, that people can see right now, correct? Yes, it is. And uh, this is looking east from uh, the New York Avenue uh, in the center of the photo here. And uh, um, uh, you've got, uh, uh, I've got to look at it too here. To your, <laughs> to your right is, uh, okay, let's keep is, holding it up there. Uh, is, uh, uh, Seaward Trail is the closest street, uh, and to your right would be going south. Uh, Seaward Trail is approximately 1,400 feet uh, down the shoreline. And then to the north is uh, Oaks Trail, which is another uh, road that is at the uh, north end of Menominee Drive, and that's about 2,600 feet. But it's really a pretty unique uh, situation that we have here in Oshkosh by having this much uh, frontage that does not have uh, any docks uh, built uh, out uh, from the, uh, the shoreline here and uh, 
uh, a lot of the folks that would rather see the pier in a different location <laughs> feel that this is a, a shoreline that we'd like to not see developed and we'd like to have it uh, remain as natural a, a, as possible. The, the, uh, at the, the hearing that we had on, with the DNR, one question is what, is what is natural that this actual shoreline was uh, destroyed as far as being natural. It's not natural anymore. It's got a blacktop uh, walking path and it's got a lawn area and therefore it's not uh, natural anymore and there's no right to try to preserve the natural uh, scenic beauty that is at this site. And so uh, at our DNR hearing that we're going to talk about a little bit uh, tonight, we, there was a lot of discussion about is there any natural scenic beauty left in Miller's Bay and I, I think uh, uh, the water is uh, beautiful, the view is beautiful uh, and we argued uh, uh, as uh, opposing the location that uh, the less man-made structures that you have uh, in an area the more natural it is even if it's not pristine like okay. it was uh, in prehistoric uh, times when the glaciers left the area. All right, um, and then you brought another map also. Um, now, what is this? This uh, is uh, uh, this basically is a city of Oshkosh uh, map that uh, shows that it is an R1 zoning. It is R1 zoning. I'm sorry, and uh, uh, the location of the pier again is approximately right in the middle of the bay. Here uh, is New York Avenue, and um, it is uh, one issue geographically uh, that this pier shows is that. Maybe we can get a little tighter shot yeah. of this also. Um, if you can see, you can see the circular donut kind of shape uh, thing at the bottom of the bay is uh, the uh, Monkey Island, which is the city of Oshkosh water settling basement, basin that is also uh, home to numerous uh, bird uh, species that uh, we learned in our hearing that this is a bird rookery, which I didn't even know what a rookery is, but it's an area <laughs> where birds uh, are in great number and breed and uh, raise their young and uh, um, there's a lot of interesting birds in the bay. Uh, in fact, this week there was about 26 uh, white pelicans in their bay yesterday, which was quite unusual to see. But uh, there are endangered bird species. The forester's tern is a kind of a seagull bird that uh, has not been seen in the bay recently, but it is a uh, uh, on the state of Wisconsin endangered species list. Um, but the the uh, bay or the pier would be located right here, and this is the, okay. about the narrowest. Push about, in again on that yeah. mic. <laughs> uh, at show that show again if you would, Chuck, please. Where? Uh, okay, the uh, pier would be located right right in this okay. location here, and it is. A very narrow strip of land. It's a, it's probably the narrowest point uh, in Menominee Park between the water and the neighboring residences. It's approximately 160 to 200 feet to the nearest residence there. As you go south in front of Webster Stanley and Melvin Avenue, which we suggested as an alternative location, you can see that the uh, the width of the uh, land area between the residences and the water is substantially wider than it is at New York Avenue. It's a very narrow spot, uh, which puts the pier right, right, in, right off the street, which, in some respects, makes it very accessible. But at the same time, it uh, it puts it close to the uh, residences, um, and uh, it also doesn't have any space for parking areas. Uh, Another issue in the case was whether the city of Oshkosh zoning ordinance requires off-street parking, and we believe it does require off-street parking anytime you construct a, a large uh, structure that will draw people to a certain location. Uh, the ordinance says you shall provide off-street parking, and this there is not enough space for off-street parking here, plus uh, it would create more of an effect on the uh, the undeveloped shoreline that we got in our photograph here and uh, you know if you've got a parking lot built there um, and we hope that there will never be a parking lot there but we uh, a lot of the people who were concerned about the piers location are concerned that uh, the lack of any off street parking will require that people park all the way up and down the street on the street which does create 
uh, traffic congestion and safety issues where okay. people are crossing. Um, there were also some uh, ADA requirement uh, concerns as well, right? Americans with Disabilities Act? Right. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act is a federal law that requires that uh, anyone disabled have the same rights uh, that a uh, non-disabled person would have. And, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, having access to uh, public uh, accommodations or peers is, uh, is an area that uh, they should have safe access. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the parking uh, issue, again, uh, there's no off-street parking at New York Avenue, and uh, um, this will necessitate that people in handicap accessible vehicles park, parallel park on the street, and the, the Americans with Disability Act requires uh, having access lanes next to a uh, handicapped parking space, so if someone's getting out of a wheelchair or uh, uh, are handicapped in some way, they've got extra space uh, to exit their vehicle, and that can't be, unfortunately here on Menominee Drive, there, there's a parallel parking space, but uh, uh, one concern we have, again, is the safety issue that uh, people will have to wheel it out of their wheelchairs into the lane of traffic there. And okay. that, again, is another reason why you would want to have off-street parking, and I think that may be somewhat behind the city's zoning ordinance that requires off-street parking because it's a safer mode of parking because you're off the street. Okay. And uh, um, it also, uh, people crossing the street that's got parked cars on both sides of the street, uh, kids are harder to see, people have a greater tendency to potentially hit a parked car. and. Uh, well, let's uh, let's give uh, Michael an opportunity yeah, to Michael kind of knows jump about in that here. Too. Uh, um, <laughs> as I mentioned in the open, you're um, a professor and, and the coordinator of the Urban and Regional Studies program at our local university here. And when this issue was sort of unfolding, you did a very extensive. I mean, this is a very comprehensive report oh, on on this. Um, <laughs> and uh, what um, you know, kind of just summarize for us, if you would please, what some of your concerns are about this particular location? Well, I evaluated the location of the pier uh, from the perspective of um, planning. And when you are locating a structure such as a pier, you want to be sure that you have the amenities available to uh, service the patrons um, at the pier. And when I looked at the location, I saw that it lacked many of the amenities that would be necessary um, to provide for those who are going to be using the pier. One of which um, uh, Chuck already mentioned, the um, inadequacy of parking. Uh, for those who are going to be patronizing the pier, they would have to uh, park on the street along Minomini Drive. And the configuration of streets um, at the location is such that it will create traffic conflicts. Conflicts between pedestrians and uh, traffic as well as uh, the maneuvering of cars in and out of the streets that intersect at that particular location. The other problem that I saw with uh, that location had to do with parking. Um, the access to off-street parking is required by the city's uh, own zoning um, regulation. It stipulates in the ordinance that if a new structure is being built, then off-street parking should be provided. And the parking should be provided within, I believe, 500 feet of the structure. When I looked at the distance between the PS location and the closest of street parking, I think it was somewhere around 1,500 feet, 1,400 feet. So uh, that, again, does not conform with the city's own uh, regulation and its own ordinance. Um, the other problem had to do with um, bathrooms. Um, which are not available on the site. You have to walk a distance of, I believe, another 1,000 feet or so to get to bathrooms that are located um, east of Webster, Webster Stanley Middle School. So there were several problems that I saw with the location of this pier at the proposed uh, location. Okay. Um, do you have some sense of where a better location, in your opinion, might be? Well, I have a sense of where the most appropriate location could be. Um, and in planning, when you're locating um, a structure, 
you always want to locate it in such a way that it is compatible with the surrounding users. Now, if we locate the pier where they are proposing to have it, uh, in fact, there are no, um, there's no synergy between the pier and the surrounding users in the area. In fact, much of that area is uh, passive recreational. Uh, it's used for passive recreational purposes. Um, and when you locate the pier there, it conflicts with the existing users um, in the area. So in my view, the best location of the pier would be south of um, where it is now, closer to uh, east of, uh, and east of Webster Stanley School, where we have adequate parking, uh, where there's much more uh, active recreational activity. So it provides some synergy with the already existing users in that area. Okay, all right. And, and that's an area, Chuck, that uh, your group was agreeable to, correct? Yes, uh, we, you know, we have never opposed putting a pier uh, for fishing in the, in the city or in the bay necessarily. It's just been the choice of location. Uh, it just seems that it's, there's a much more reasonable location. Uh, I know uh, Dr. Briardi just talked about some of the issues. The other, another issue was lighting that he, mm -hmm. that he, he had mentioned in his report. And uh, uh, there is existing lighting that illuminate the piers that are low, all the piers, in fact, I think every single pier in Oshkosh is illuminated, but this one will not be. And uh, one of the arguments we, our concerns we have is navigational safety, foreboding safety, uh, snowmobiles in the winter, uh, an unlighted pier. Uh, it's, it's not to be lighted according to the DNR uh, permit. And we, as neighbors, we don't want big lights up there. We, we really don't, and uh, most people wouldn't. Uh, it's a beautiful area at night. Uh, the moon rises we've had the last couple months over the bay are just absolutely unbelievable. Uh, but the uh, uh, lack of lighting, you know, preserves kind of the natural beauty of the area, but at the same time it creates a navigation, uh, snowmobile safety issue, and also a security issue on the pier itself. Uh, you know, people are out there at night, uh, somebody gets robbed or worse, uh, uh, what's, what are they going to do? They're going to put lights up. You mm -hmm. know, eventually lights will go up or if someone, a snowmobile uh, hits the pier, what's going to happen? Hey, we need lights, yep. you know, and there will be lights there. But, uh, you know, the pier is going to be there probably a hundred years. And so we, uh, the planning for this pier took 24 hours uh, <laughs> of decision, ma or the decision making took 24 hours to decide. Uh, which is absolutely unacceptable in my mm -hmm. mind. Uh, but uh, it, uh, you know, the moving it further south would provide a, a degree of lighting that is not present. Uh, it would it would still be private, and the the club, the Otter Street Fishing Club, who is the one who really has decided the location, uh, feels that it's too close to the other uh, motorboat docks. Um, that are to the south, and that uh, is is a concern they have. Uh, our our answer to that is you're still uh, 12 to 1,200, 1,400 feet uh, north of those docks. Uh, there are large berms that kind of make this a more of a private location, so you're separated from those uh, those motorboat docks, and all the motorboats generally go out the south entrance of the bay so they wouldn't be going uh, in front of the uh, alternative location we had. And we, as the alternative, we were thinking it would be between Melvin Avenue and uh, Seaward Trail, uh, which is about a thousand feet south of New York Avenue. So we're talking about moving it a thousand feet south where there'll be lighting, off street parking, paved trail, privacy. Bathrooms. Bathrooms. Yeah. Uh, there's even a, I didn't think of this, but someone said to me, there's, you know, there's a hot dog stand <laughs> over there too. <laughs> so it'll be close to the, the hot dog stand, uh, but, but not too close. I mean, it, it isn't right, uh, it isn't right in the parking lot. It isn't right, you know, uh, it, it's still private. And, uh, um, and uh, it just seems that, you know, as a compromise that that, just moving it a thousand feet and the, you know, the frontage in that bay is like 9,000 feet of frontage mm -hmm. uh, to choose from, and uh, uh, they've chosen the narrowest strip that's close to the other residences that blocks, you know, creates, upsets the view there and uh, has parking issues, no lighting, you know, all sorts of things. And uh, um, it's well. just, uh, 
And, you know, th I think the point should be made that um, there were attempts made by your group, uh, both formal and informal, um, to sort of mediate this whole issue with the Otter Street Fishing Club. And, uh, by the way, I, I should state that at the outset of this whole thing, um, I did ask uh, Terry Waller from the Otter Street Fishing Club to appear, and, uh, of course, that request was declined. So um, I have not asked him again uh, if he'd ever like to come on. Um, he's more than willing to, um, more than welcome and, uh, and willing to come on. Um, however, um, you've, you, these attempts were made, and, and they failed. Why did they fail, in your opinion? Well, or I guess Michael, uh, you've got a, a thought on that too. Yeah, I, I mean, I it, it's it's really uh, been a frustrating two years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I, I guess uh, as a lawyer, a lot of the cases we get, you some you never can compromise, you know. But uh, we had hoped you could, and in this particular case, I think I, I personally would have rather seen the city give a little more help to the process. It was kind of like. You know, you guys talk to the fishing club. You know, it's their decision. Uh, they're paying for it, and I, I think, you know, they are paying for it. It's a wonderful donation, and uh, it's a great thing they're trying to do. Uh, but we 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 just can't convince them that can't you find a little better location that'll eliminate all these potential problems. And uh, but I wish that some of the people like the city mayor or the uh, Parks director or the city attorney. I, I wish they, they would have tried to be a little more uh, a con not, not really accommodating, but I think they've tried to be. But just it's frustrating that it's kind of like, well, that's a decision we made, and we can't change it. You know, it's uh, up to the club. You know, and uh, well, and uh, I think that's <laughs> one of the very reasons why things shouldn't be rushed through mm -hmm. as quickly as as they are. Yeah. I was surprised when I looked at the process uh, that was um, used to approve of the PS location that it was so abridged. And when I looked at several other communities around the country, the way that they address peer locations is to have the peers proposal come before the planning commission. Uh, it has to be reviewed thoroughly to mm -hmm. ensure that it has no adverse impact on the neighborhood. And many of these communities have peers under conditional uses, which automatically require that they undergo this um, process of public hearing and extensive review, especially when they are large community peers, as um, uh, the one that is being proposed is. Um, so one compromise, in my view, would be to um, send the proposal back to the Planning Commission, open the discussion up to uh, neighborhood groups and the general public so that we have an open deliberative process and come to uh, an agreed upon uh, or at least even if the planning commission still uh, um, insists or finds that the location is the most appropriate, then at least the community has had the opportunity to make their presentation. And they would have felt that their needs have been um, ad addressed before the decision is, the final decision is made. So in my view, I think we should take it back to the planning commission, have a public hearing, and ultimately come to a decision that may be agreeable to everybody. You mean Parks Board, because it was never before the uh, Planning well, yeah, Commission at all. Yeah, it was never before the Planning Commission, right. but my suggestion is that it can go through the Parks mm -hmm. Board and also the Planning Commission, because this is a major structure, in my view, with potential Im adverse impact on the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the Planning Commission has to be involved in deciding on its location. Well, and if there's zoning concerns, Right. Um, as as right. you've raised, then probably before the uh, Board of Zoning appeals as well. Right. I um, I don't think uh, from that the zoning uh, department in Oshkosh or the planning office had any input on this location. It was decided. You know. I I mean. I, and again, it it sounded like a good idea, but it was just and why it was had to be fast tracked. You know uh, what we learned in the DNR hearing. I, I guess that for the first time, I didn't know this, but that they were planning to build it in the winter of uh, 2005, you know, so this is June 13th and it's got to be fast-tracked, mm -hmm. you know, right away, but it's not going to be built for another six months, or seven months actually, and uh, uh, and it still had to go through the DNR pr process. Well, uh, Chuck, one of the things that, uh, you know, some people in the community say is that this is just a, um, what's referred to affectionately as a NIMBY issue, yeah. not in my <laughs> backyard issue, yeah, yeah. but uh, there are members of your group um, who 
and, and also people in the community who oppose this peer location um, who are not um, neighbors of this particular area, right. correct? And, uh, I, yeah, and I think it's been uh, unfairly, uh, you know, the people who live in that area, many of who are opposed to it, or most of them are, uh, uh, are not the only ones who are opposed to it. I think everyone is concerned about it. I have people talk to me uh, all the time and say, you know, I think, how did they arrive at that location and can't they find a better location and why there and, uh, you know, I, but um, there are people from, you know, all over the country who come here and they, and a lot of them, you know, I know from who, you know, lived during the past and they're opposed to the location and, uh, I don't know. It's uh, but, but the other it, thing too is that I don't live in the neighborhood. Yeah, and you and don't. So <laughs> hopefully, when I did my report, it was an objective report. True. Um, I was not biased. Um, mm -hmm. I provided what I believe was an objective, candid report about what the effects of the peer would be in the neighborhood. So. And were you paid to do your report? No, I I, I was not paid. Maybe Chuck will pay me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to pay you. Yeah, and we appreciated <laughs> his uh, willingness to review it, and we. Uh, but it, it is interesting that Oshkosh adopted in 2002 a City of Oshkosh comprehensive outdoor recreation plan, which is kind of a uh, blueprint for developing uh, recreational parks in Oshkosh that uh, was approved by the. Parks Board, it was approved by the City Council, it was uh, reviewed and uh, accepted by the DNR, and the idea of it is to uh, make sure that there's adequate proper planning in the parks. And, uh, you know, and the, the uh, mission statement, you know, is to preserve uh, significant open space and enhance the city's natural resources and natural beauty and recreation. and. You know, and uh, they they say uh, you know reserve uh, uh, for future growth uh, accessible open space uh, include both active and passive recreation recreation areas within uh, the parks. Uh, this is a good one. Solicit solicit public input in the planning and development of the park systems, particularly in location and design of the neighborhood parks. Which you know they didn't solicit any input. They, no. In fact, they misrepresented what they were doing uh, when they called it a fishing deck, or not maybe not misrepresented, but uh, definitely gave it a kind of a, you know, slant on it that made it sure. sound less, uh, but, uh, and they want you to provide uh, sufficient uh, screening, buffering to separate neighboring residents from uh, organized recreation activities that could be a source of nuisance, like the Bowen Street Dock is right on top of the residences there. It's been a source of nuisance for years. Um, it, it has had parking issues. They, they actually eliminated all parking mm -hmm. on Bowen Street yep. uh, because it was such a problem there. Um, uh, and, uh, and they provide safe uh, crossings at uh, street intersections. You know, and the safety issue, really, uh, there are some of the people who are they're like, we don't really you know, care about the beauty issue, but the safety. How are these, you're going to have cars parked on both sides of the street, three intersection, you know, three streets intersecting, kids, uh, people driving down who look at the Miller's Bay because it's such a beautiful view uh, and, uh, you know, and you got a narrow, the narrowest strip of land here and uh, what's going to happen, uh, you know, hopefully not a, not an accident, but it's, sure. it's very, uh, you know, it's very likely that it'll happen sure. at some point. So in May, uh, just last month, there was a two-day hearing. Right. Um, and as I said, you both were there testifying. Um, there were uh, other citizens testifying as well, as did the city and the DNR. Now, unlike a trial, there weren't closing arguments done there. Uh, the closing arguments were submitted in written form after the hearing. And um, you, on behalf of the citizen group, um, filed your closing arguments first. Uh, you filed yours, uh, they were drafted anyway, on May 15th. Just mm -hmm. kind of give us a, a, a grocery list, in layman's terms, Chuck, if you would, of what your closing arguments were. What are the highlights of them? I well, think we've I guess, heard some of yeah, them. Yeah, I've, I've probably uh, said a lot of it already, but the, the geography of the location was, a, was an issue that, uh, you know, geographically it's a narrow spot. It doesn't have the... Uh, it also, which I haven't mentioned yet, is it is located where we had one 
witness say that uh, there is ice expansion uh, that that if the pier was located behind uh, or slightly uh, to the south where it would be sheltered by Monkey Island, there would be less uh, chance of ice expansion. Now we don't have ice shoves down here that I've ever seen in the, ever, but uh, uh, we do have expansion of the ice sheet across the lake and it's about eight miles across. And uh, so one argument was there could be a maintenance issue here. Mm -hmm. The other thing is we have the bird rookery over here and we have birds that will be coming on this pier and uh, will, which we have already on the docks down to the south and uh, that creates a, uh, uh, a biohazard unless it's cleaned. Also uh, uh, when you're on a wet pier that's got wet uh, bird droppings on it, it is slicker than yes, you know what. Is. And uh, it, it is, so they should clean it. And, and the administrative law judge was going to order that they clean it on a regular basis. And I, I, it'll be interesting if it would be in, in built. Um, well, what's a regular basis? That was an issue in the case. And, and there was, a, I think, one of the DNR uh, uh, officials who testified talked, I think, about doing it once a week. Uh, right. And uh, you know, once a week, uh, having to go out and clean this you know, and then we talked about, well, maybe when it needs it, you know, and should it be once a month? But they're out there, you know, they're cleaning the goose off of the trail, which is, a, <laughs> uh, you know, issue. And then, uh, uh, you know, they, but they will need to clean it. And, uh, uh, but that was uh, the, the ge geography of the location, you know, if, again, if you could get it where it would be in the shelter or the lee side of the island, that might make it uh, less of a maintenance issue, you'd still have to clean it, but at least it would be in the general area of the other docks. Uh, we also talked about, uh, again, the safety issues, which the parking, the, uh, the lighting, uh, the, the potential snowmobile, uh, motorboat issues. Uh, the, the DNR said, well, there's, Miller's Bay is a no-wake zone, uh, and I, uh, there, there is an ordinance in Oshkosh that I, I became aware of in this case that says uh, that, that Miller's Bay is no wake, uh, which I, I don't think a lot of boaters are aware of that fact that the whole bay is supposed to be uh, no wake zone. And, that, and the DNR said, well, because of that, uh, no one's going to get injured if they collide with this pier. But I think anybody who's lived in the area knows that there's boats going full speed uh, mm -hmm. on plane in that bay daily. Uh, <coughs> and. Uh, and the DNR said, well, there's the snowmobiles, there's not that many snowmobiles that use it, but I, you know, I, I see snowmobiles going at a high rate of speed. Uh, uh, and again, it's going to be unlighted at the moment until, until something that happens. First time and then it's going to be happens. lighted. And then, uh, but so you've started kind of addressing, um, we're going to give Michael a chance to jump yeah, back right in ahead. here <laughs> at some point, but uh, you've kind of started addressing uh, you know, some of the um, counter arguments uh, to to your arguments mm -hmm. um, but on May 25th both the city and the DNR put together their arguments and mm -hmm. uh, and in written form again and, and filed them I'm not exactly sure if they were filed on the 25th but they're dated the 25th anyway mm -hmm. what are some of the rest of their arguments to sort yeah, of it's, counter well, it kind of gets into the the law in the state of Wisconsin as it relates to uh, navigable waters uh, and the public's interest, uh, it's, it's interesting, uh, there's a right to navigation that uh, was in the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, I think it was, and that, that ordinance said that you couldn't obstruct uh, navigation in the waterways in the Northwest Ordinance, which uh, Wisconsin was part of, and we, they've adopted that actually in the Wisconsin Constitution. So the one issue was, was does it impair or affect navigation? And again, that includes boats running into the pier. Uh, the DNR said, well, again, because of the, there's not a lot of boats at that location that it should be uh, hopefully not that big of a risk. Again, we said, oh, if you could just move it a little bit south where it will be lighted and you won't need lights, then you'll reduce the risk of a, you know, someone running into it even more. Uh, but the, the other law issue is the public's rights in the waterway, which uh, include uh, the right to access to the water. 
and the right to fish, uh, and the right to, to have uh, scenic natural beauty. And uh, the, the DNR uh, said, well, again, all the scenic natural beauty has been destroyed. This is not scenic natural beauty anymore. And, uh, and therefore, we don't think putting a, a pier out there uh, will have an impact on the, on the scenic natural beauty. And we, we argued, well, the pier itself may be, you know, smaller than, I mean, it's, it's still 108 feet by 100 feet wide. And, uh, um, but we said all of the activity that will be drawn there will create a, a concentration of people and cars and, you know, things that will upset the natural beauty of the shoreline. Uh, but they argued that it, it wouldn't. Um, and that they also argued that worrying about urban planning issues like parking, lighting, the DNR doesn't care about that. They, they only care about does, the, na does it affect navigation, does it affect wildlife, does it affect uh, the public's rights to and access and, uh, you know, scenic natural beauty. And, uh, uh, you know, and we, we tried to say, well, you, you can't go in there with blinders on DNR, you got to look at what's going to develop here because of this structure being built here. Uh, this is going to, you know, there it will be urban planning issues. Sure. And well, and, and I think that's where the city comes in, exactly. shouldn't it? I, I mean, it, should. it, it may not, but it should, <laughs> right? It should have come in right at the start, uh, especially in my view, the planning commission um, should have taken a closer look mm -hmm. at what impact this um, peer would have on the neighborhood. And that did not happen. Do you know why maybe it didn't go to the Planning Commission? I mean, if you can kind of gaze in, into yeah. a crystal ball here um, and, and not necessarily look at, look at the future, but kind of look backwards. Um, when you think of Planning Commissions, you think of uh, structures that are actual buildings. Yes. Uh, you think of garages, houses, um, retail centers, office buildings, what have you. You don't necessarily right. think about a fishing pier per se? Because the fishing pier, in my view, um, was regarded as a non-land use structure. That is, it's not built on the land, it's built on the water. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the planning department did not um, uh, have anything to do with the location of a structure in water or on water uh, since it was not on the land. Mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, the reason I can think of, of why it did not go through the planning commission. Mm -hmm. It is connected to the land, though. Right, it is it built has on, the land. on the land. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, so definitely does. And oh. uh, uh, the DNR in the in the hearing did talk about the wildlife. Whether this is, this area is a foraging area, which I didn't know what that meant, like rookery either. But that's where <laughs> birds <laughs> birds search for food. And uh, but they said again that they don't search as much as they used to because it's been uh, mowed and uh, grassed and. Uh, uh, and the shoreline is riprap, and again, it's been changed. But uh, we feel we shouldn't change it anymore. We, again, we've got a very unique thing here. Uh, uh, the, the Otter Street Fishing Club wants to build another pier north at, at Nevada Street. You know, and they, you know, whether they will ever do that, I don't know. You know but they, they would like to see one there, too. I think they'd like to see piers wherever they can be built in order to uh, provide access to fishing, which is a worthy cause, and it is a public right uh, in the waterway. But, but you uh, know, really, and, and this kind of goes to both of your arguments. Um, number one, you know, we've got fishing piers as it is in a number of places throughout the city. Right. And you can drive by at any given time, and um, with very few exceptions, I think you'd be lucky to find you know, five to ten people or more mm -hmm. using it at the same time. So, you know, on the one hand, will this create as much traffic as you're saying? Right. But on the other hand, um, you know, how how many fishing piers do we need when they're not, they don't seem to be being utilized right. as much as what the fishing club might like them to be? Right, and I, uh, they, they the, some of the people uh, from the club, actually Terry Wohler testified at the hearing and he uh, said something to the effect, you know, that there's only going to be six people on this pier or something, you know, and some incredibly small number, which may be, tr you know, I mean, very true. And, and I guess uh, the concerns we have is this is a permanent pier. It's going to be here for the next hundred plus years. 
it may not have anybody using it much in the next five, ten years. What about twenty years? You know, mm -hmm. what about thirty years, uh, forty years? Uh, it's it's going to be, uh, you know, and I'm hoping that it won't be used much. I mean, it, but it, why build it in this particular spot with all of the potential adverse consequences if you got an alternative location that is almost as you know, it's just a thousand feet south. It's, uh, well, you know. and, and again, <laughs> how many fishing piers do we need in this general type area, too? I don't know. I mean, I, you know, we read about uh, the river walk in Oshkosh mm -hmm. and trying to develop in front of the Pioneer and all, you know, all of this beautiful river frontage we have mm -hmm. that looks like, you know, a, mat, a bombed uh, <laughs> a war zone in mm -hmm. some of these areas, you know, the Morgan Street site, you know, Morgan plant, right. uh, you know, the Pioneer. Uh, you know, don't you know? Couldn't we build it there? I know, or you know, spend the money over there, I, or uh, over in 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 the in the park here too. There's a, a train bridge that uh, this little bridge here, and it 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 is right in the lagoon here. And uh, master's plans from the past had had little fishing piers in the lagoon. The lagoon is a good fishing area, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but there is a there is a little bridge there. That thing is about to collapse into the. The, the, the water it needs repairs, you know. I mean, and who's going to pay for all this? We have a parks board or parks budget that is shrinking. We have a, you know, uh, taxes that are going through the roof, and we we're building something that the city's got to maintain. Um, sure. And uh, you know, how many do you build? But but uh, it's a it's a interesting you know dilemma. And again, I think everybody would have been. Uh, more more comfortable with the decision if it had been made with adequate input, adequate review, and really, you know, is there a need for mm -hmm. it? Uh, and uh, uh, those well, issues are relevant, I think. Uh, you're expecting um, some kind of a response uh, decision from Judge Bolt, is it? Yes. Uh, um, on July 1st, and I, I know in, in reading some of the things that you have, have written and in talking with you, you're kind of expecting the judge to, and you know, and judges are hard to predict, but you are sort of expecting that the judge is going to um, support the decision of, of the DNR and their side on things. Why mm -hmm. do you feel that way? Well, there is, there is kind of a presumption that uh, the DNR is an expert in uh, making these decisions about peers. Um, and uh, the administrative law judge, uh, we had uh, Judge Bolt, has been an administrative law judge, made many, many decisions uh, involving DNR cases. Uh, I thought he was very uh, objective and, and, you know, attentive and uh, patient. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but he often, he often objected, or they would object to me talking about, uh, you know, that the city has a zoning ordinance requiring a parking lot here. And, uh, you know, they'd say objection, that's not relevant to the DNR's analysis, you know, and, uh, and he, would hear it, but he, he, he again, you know, said that he thought, you know, that again they're dealing with uh, how does it affect the navigation, the scenic mm -hmm. beauty, the the water quality, the uh, wildlife, uh, and the urban planning issues. The city should deal with those. And uh, again, and the city has said we should we should our our venue or you know for this should really be in the city, trying to persuade the city folks. And uh, the city council, uh, we've, we haven't gone back to them lately. Uh, we, I think we did a year or so ago to ask them. and They won't do anything. They won't do anything. Uh, you know, and I guess that's, we have a new mayor. We have another, we have some new council members. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I think our mayor that we have is trying to accommodate things, mm -hmm. uh, work things out with people. And I, I don't know if he would be neat if he could look at this. I think they'd like to see what the DNR decides. If the DNR sure. said it's denied, they can't build it right. here, that would get the city off the hook. <laughs> All right. Well, so I guess we'll, we'll wait for the decision. Um, right. And what if it uh, is in the DNR in the city's favor? Will you appeal that? You've got, what, 30 days to appeal that? I believe so. And I, I whether we will appeal it, I, I guess we'll have to see if any of the uh, people want to. I think everybody's rather 
frustrated like I am mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of tired of this well, it's issue. it's been a long two it's years. Been a, it's been know, a grind. And I'm, and, uh, I'm sure you all have, uh, um, you know, bigger fish to fry. No pun right. intended. <laughs> so, all right. That let's, is uh, true. We're, we're down to about, uh, <coughs> probably about 12 minutes here. So let's quickly move on to a couple other things here and see how much of this we can get knocked out. Um, there's a proposed concept for over along Oshkosh Avenue. It's a group of developers led by Landmark Real Estate out of De Pere is proposing a $20 million project, which involves condominiums, apartments, a hotel, and a conference center. It would um, involve taking part of the, buying part of the property over there, which uh, includes Robin's Restaurant. Um, it would also, um, the project would jut into the fairway for hole number two on Lakeshore Municipal Golf Course, and it also would require that a TIF district be created. Now, <laughs> let's turn to you, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Beretti. Um, the creation of another TIF district in Oshkosh. I mean, first of all, we have got more TIFs in this city, uh, in particular open TIFs, than pretty much anybody around. Um, you know, it, from that standpoint alone, it seems yeah. kind of foolhardy to me. But what seems really problematic here um, is, you know, a TIF district in an area where it's right along a lake and you've got a golf course there. I mean, does this meet the criteria? No. <laughs> uh, under state TIFs law? Uh, are used for purposes of blight removal. Where and there has to be um, a justification for the TIF, and the TIF has to meet what the state calls the but for requirement, and that is, uh, you have to show that unless a TIF is created, there will be no development at the particular location. In this case, uh, there's no justification for creating a TIF so that you build a um, hotel and condominium um, and convention center mm -hmm. at the site. Uh, first of all, it's not blighted, mm -hmm. so um, uh, it doesn't meet the first criteria. The second criteria of the bad four uh, criteria also is not met because the area is healthy. Uh, there's no reason to create and provide incentives in order to attract a developer to the site. So um, the creation of a TIF for that particular uh, area is not justified at all. Well, and, and even Jackson Kinney, our own director of community <laughs> yes. development, has, has said that, look, folks, there's, there's some problems here with your meeting the criteria um, for TIF creation in this particular area. Now, one of the things that I've heard, and I, I haven't been able to confirm this, but I have heard that one of the arguments that the um, potential developers want to make is that, hey, the city of Nina created a TIF in an unblighted area for, uh, I don't know if it's where the w Super Walmart is up there or exactly where it is, but mm -hmm. you know, that is what I've heard the argument, or one of them anyway, is going to be. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I mean, I don't even know that that actually happened in Nina, but let's just for the sake of argument say it did. I mean, does that mean that Oshkosh sh should then follow suit and break a state law in order to put this development in there and, and create a TIF to do um, it. Uh, it doesn't make sense um, to start with. If even Nina used that process to attract Walmart or whatever development to uh, Nina, it does not mean that we should also use the same flawed process to bring uh, this company to town. Uh, so if you look at it in all ways, it doesn't make sense at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad that Justin Kinney decided this is not the right way to come to TIF. Well, and I've not heard any more about this. Um, you know, th this first sort of came to the public's attention, I guess, about six or seven weeks ago, right. mm -hmm. and haven't really heard a whole lot more since then. So I don't know if it's um, still kind of in the planning stages where they want to bring it forward at some point, or have either mm -hmm. of you heard? No. Yeah. But the other thing that we need to keep <coughs> in mind is that Highway 41 is going to be realigned. Yes. It's going to be, I believe, six or eight, uh, eight lanes now. Mm -hmm. And so that entire area is going to be reconfigured. And so how is that going to affect the proposed development? Um, that has to be taken into consideration. Well, and maybe they're even looking at that. I mean, maybe that's one of the reasons that uh, they've chosen this particular location. I, mm -hmm. Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, and also, we want to touch on the um, 
Riverfront along the Fox River and the Access Acquisition Group. Now, there's already a TIF that's created there, mm -hmm. um, so that wouldn't be necessary. And, you know, unlike Tom Doig from the uh, kind of the sunken five rivers <laughs> proposal, um, you know, these people from Access have um, been very open with the public. You know, they've been willing to meet with the city in, in public rather than behind closed doors the way Tom Doig always did. Um, they've done online things through the Northwestern's website, you know, a discussion board type thing where people can send questions in uh, online and, and they'll answer them kind of in real time, I guess. Um, so they've been much more open with the public and uh, by the way they will be access acquisition will be coming on this show uh, in in uh, not in the not too distant future as well um, to talk about their plans so um, you know have you been impressed with their willingness to work with the city and work with the citizens very much so um, I think they have an open process and so um, the process is to be um, commended but ultimately the public is going to judge the outcome of the, pro the process. Mm -hmm. So whereas the process is a good one, the ultimate outcome is what development takes place in the area that is going to be used to evaluate the, um, the effectiveness of the process. And my concern was that the uh, city gave uh, access the title or authority to be the master um, developer. Mm -hmm. And I had concerns about that because once you give them the master developer status, then it seems to me that the city is backing off from taking an active role in ensuring that the type of development that takes place meets with the objectives that the city wants. Um, as far as I know, Access has not provided a concept plan, a comprehensive concept plan for the development of the area. There are a few one or two projects that um, uh, Access at least has uh, informed the public that they want to implement. Uh, there is perhaps maybe 60, 70 percent of the area that still uh, remains to be developed. And we don't know what is going to go on in that uh, part of the, the area. And so in my view, until Access provides the community with a comprehensive concept plan, they should not have been given the status of master developer mm -hmm. because we don't know what they're going to do. And so if now somebody wants to uh, develop or redevelop any area in the, 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 um, the riverfront, they will have to contact and consult with Access to get their permission mm -hmm. to do it. This should have gone through the city council and the planning commission and I believe the Oshkosh Development Authority. Well, y now that you mention that, see, I guess I did not understand what the uh, title of master developer really entailed. And if, if that's correct, that anyone else who wants to develop anything along that particular area that, that they are master developer of, that they'd have to be contacting, yes. you know, acqui access, access acquisition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that sort of seems that the city has abdicated its authority over that uh, entire region then. If our interpretation is correct, yes, um, because uh, in my view, the city has to continue to um, monitor what is going on. In fact, all development proposals for the site should come before the city, either the council, the development authority, or the planning commission. Mm -hmm. uh, access should not be given that authority to evaluate development proposals uh, and making decisions on behalf of the city. Okay. Uh, and I did meet with uh, Tim, so if Tim is watching, this is not a criticism of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a criticism <laughs> of the process. <laughs> well, um, you know, one, one of the things that uh, has primarily been discussed so far is a very affluent, upscale type office building going in there. And um, I, I just want to touch quickly on this with each of you. Um, you know, one of the concerns that we've heard so far is that if you're going to put office space in there, you're going to be pulling uh, office tenants from other office buildings. And, um, you know, that could be downtown, that could be anywhere in the city. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what I understand, because if you talk to realtors, you talk to commercial lenders, uh, you talk to other developers, they, you know, they all just say, well, you know, this is, this is the way development works. 
and everybody's out for building a better mousetrap. And, uh, you know, so I, I guess how would you respond to that? I mean, is, is this the way development works? Um, well, hopefully, when an office structure is built, they're not going to draw from the uh, already existing businesses in the downtown area or in the city of Ashkosh. Uh, I'm hopeful that they'll be able to draw people or businesses from outside. But if when the structure is built, many or most of those who um, are going to use the structure are from within the city of Ashkosh, then it isn't contributing to an increase of economic activity in the community. Uh, so I wouldn't say that that's how business is done. And that is why initially I was of the view that any person who is going to redevelop this riverfront would come up with a comprehensive master plan, concept pl plan for the area. So the city then knows, oh, here we're going to have an office structure, there we're going to have condominiums, we're going to have uh, live work units here and there. So th we have a comprehensive view of what is going to take place. Then we can evaluate it at a go rather than doing it in a piecemeal basis. Because now we are hoping that the office structure will draw in a restaurant and maybe a hotel mm -hmm. and some other uses. What if that doesn't occur? And, and so in my view, it is always best to have a comprehensive concept plan before an approval is given. And that is why I had a criticism of the, uh, the process. Okay. Chuck, is your office downtown? Yeah, I'm uh, in the post office or next to the post office, okay. in the, the, where the IRS office used to be uh, on okay. the State and Otter Street, and uh, um, it's a nice area. We look at the the hundred block uh, that's empty, the first floor of that <laughs> building, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, you know I, I I saw some comments by the developers on this access thing the other night, and they talked about you know it's a capitalist way to do it, and they'll be creating a larger real estate tax base and. You know, if they rent the building or mm -hmm. the office building, mm -hmm. and uh, and it'll be, you know, it'll cause the other owners downtown who maybe lose tenants to upgrade their buildings sure. and try to. And you know, I can and see and where that would have that kind of. I impact. mean, it's 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 hard to say, but we we have a you know we got an empty hundred block. We got a. I hope they don't build a, have an empty <laughs> office building there. Uh, we've got a lot of empty land uh, where they've torn stuff down, uh, you know, it, and replaced it with mm -hmm. you know the hundred block they replaced bunch of old buildings uh, but it's sitting vacant uh, the hotel is vacant the convention center is not uh, you know <laughs> uh, it's it's hopefully they these guys though they they're trying to put something in that'll work you know they, well, they and have they're, demand and they're appealing they're, to yeah, I mean, um, they're, they're not putting something that won't you know, if they can't get anybody to go in there, right. I think they're going to Right and I can't it. imagine uh, that they would would do that intentionally but, but I, I, I think I think um um um, point is worth uh, noting, and that is who is going to be in that office structure? Is it going to be, are they pulling from the yeah. downtown area? Are they pulling from existing businesses? Right. Or are these going to be new businesses? Right. Ideally, you want the structure to mm -hmm. bring in new businesses right. to the downtown area. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if they're just pulling from within the community, then it's not contributing much to the community's economic yeah. development. I think, I think realistically, it'll yeah. probably end up being both. Because I know yeah. that they're trying to target, uh, you know, um, more key personnel mm -hmm. for their corporations. They're trying to target, uh, uh, you know, larger clients and, and that kind of thing. So it'll probably it end may, up being. It may both. keep some business that would have moved out of downtown up to Appleton. You know, people All leave right. because it's there's nothing available. But well, very good. Right. Well, listen, thanks uh, to both of you for being here. It's it's always a pleasure to have you guys here, and uh, you know we'll see how all of this pans out with with yeah. everything. So, and as always, uh, thanks to the crew, and uh, most importantly, thanks to you folks at home for um, inviting us into your homes for the last hour. We'll see you next time. Until then, take good care and keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh.
Oh, 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 oh,